What's going on guys, Martin here and welcome to my YouTube channel. I filmed this video a few days ago and I wanted to kick things off by addressing a topic which I get asked literally all of the time. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and as always, if you have any questions about it, just leave them below in the comment section. In today's video, I'm going to explain the key differences in how a professional player thinks about poker compared to an amateur or most recreational players. And this is by far the most common questions I get asked whenever I tell anyone that I play poker for a living. Uh, people seem genuinely curious and interested in how, what that process is like to, to make the step to play professionally, what separates an amateur from a pro. And as far as thinking about the game uh, goes and, and your approach to the game, I would say that the key differences between a professional and an amateur is that the professional player is thinking in ranges, whereas the amateur is only thinking about a specific holding and at the same time is trying to guess his opponent's exact hand. And the main problem with this approach is that since poker is a game of incomplete information, uh, it's not very realistic to narrow down an unknown range into just one single combination. The second problem with this approach is that if you're wrong, and you're going to be wrong most of the time, you're much more likely to make the wrong final decision. Simply because you've only given yourself two options and you've oversimplified the game, which isn't very realistic. Whenever you're trying to achieve something that's practically impossible, you're also more likely to base your decision making on confirmation biases uh, rather than rational thinking. This will also lead to a greater likelihood of you compounding the same mistakes over and over, which will of course end up costing you a lot of money in the long run. Pros on the other hand break down hands using one simple but very important concept and that is called range versus range interaction. Basically what you need to recognize is what range of hands does your opponent have, what range of hands do you have and how do they interact versus each other. Who has more value-heavy strong hands in this situation? This is called range advantage and it's another core concept which dictates how much money you're able to put into the pot, uh, essentially how big you can bet and at what frequency. And this is why it's incredibly important to have a good idea of what sort of preflop strategies your opponents are playing from all the different positions. You're then constantly narrowing down your opponent's range uh, street by street depending on the information you're receiving. This provides clarity and simplifies the game. It also produces less nerves whenever you're bluffing uh, because playing a balanced strategy brings confidence as opposed to guessing and feeling like you're not really sure what you're doing. Just think about all the value combinations you would have in this exact same spot. But to do all this, you first need to understand how range versus range interaction works. So let's take one of the most extreme examples of differentiation in ranges by looking at an under the gun raise versus a big blind defend. Naturally, under the gun will have a much tighter range uh, raising out of position and having seven or eight players left to act behind, whereas the big blind will be forced to defend a very wide range uh, simply due to the pot outs he's receiving. If we compare the charts, we also see that it's quite clear that different boards will connect with each player's range in a quite polarizing way. For example, if the board comes all low cards, even though the big blind has a much wider range, under the gun is still forced to proceed with caution because he lacks any sort of connectivity with the board and the nut advantage goes to the big blind who can have all sorts of straights, two pairs and sets, which under the gun simply doesn't have. On the flip side, high card boards favors under the gun whose tight range easily connects if the board comes ace-king-9 for example. If we look at the under the gun versus big blind scenario again and we put ourselves in under the gun's shoes and let's say we raise pocket eights and the flop counts ace jack four, before we decide whether we want to bet or check our eights in this spot, we want to start by asking ourselves one very important question and that is, who has the range advantage in this spot? In a lot of cases, as the preflop racer, our range advantage is so big that we just want to go ahead and bet our entire range. Once we bet the flop and got in called, our opponent's range immediately becomes more defined 
and in a lot of instances capped, which means that we can, it provides us with a lot more clarity and we can decide whether we want to attack that cap range by, on the turn by perhaps over betting or, or betting big at least to put max pressure on him. Or we can decide if we want to check and see a free river. And this is why continuation betting is such a powerful tool. Let's pretend the board is 754 with a flush draw instead. In this scenario, we don't have the range advantage, which means that we have to be somewhat selective with which hands we elect to bet. We do this in order to protect ourselves from getting check raised and be put in a tough spot where we simply lack enough strong hands to continue on a lot of different runouts. In this scenario, it still makes sense to bet some hands, so the question is which ones? When deciding the combinations we want to bet, it makes sense to pick the ones that benefit the most from protection, uh, has some sort of connectivity with the board, and also has the ability to make the nuts. As we can see, pocket eights ticks all of these boxes. For one, it benefits to bet to protect versus over cards. For example, if our opponent has a hand like jack-10 or even ace-jack, uh, he's simply forced to check fold his hand because he has no connectivity with the board. Folding out over cards like these is a big win for us when we have a small pair, since these still has six outs to improve. Secondly, pocket eights blocks a lot of strong hands in our opponent's range. This is called a blocker effect, and it basically means that when we have two eights in our hand, the likelihood and probability of our opponent having an eight in his hand drastically decrease. And finally, it has the potential to improve to the nuts. Uh, which means that we can actually continue in case we get check raised. And this is very valuable because the last thing we want to do is bet fold a hand that has a lot of equity, especially in position. Even though a hand like pocket aces is a much stronger hand in theory, in this case it would make for a much better check since it doesn't take any of these boxes. We would then pick our bluffs from hands that lack any sort of showdown value and would benefit the most from folding out superior hands that doesn't interact with the board. We don't generally want to bet hands that has showdown value or has a lot of equity to improve in case we fill up on the turn and river. If we bet ace-king here, our opponent is forced to fold out almost all of his weaker aces and kings, so we have more incentive to check and keep those dominated aces and kings in his range and hope that we both improve. To sum things up, always assign your opponent a range of hands and rather weigh up the likelihood of each possible combination before you make your decision. If you like this video, please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel.